thank you at least someone to say my name uh, hello everyone and uh, happy to be here today to give you a few points on retinal vascular occlusions but retinal vascular occlusions is a very very vast topic so to finish it in 10 minutes is like next to impossible but i'll try to do justice at least tell you some of the salient points okay. so you can have arterial occlusions you can have venous occlusions you can have combined occlusions the arterial occlusion central retinal branch retinal ciliary retinal artery and the ophthalmic artery occlusions uh, we'll go to venous occlusions first. They pre can present as an acute defective vision. They can present as an incidental diagnosis. Sometimes when you're working up the patient for cataract and you're looking inside, you might find a sheathed blood vessel because if it doesn't involve the macula in a branch vein occlusion, it will not be symptomatic. And sometimes it presents with complications. You're seeing traction retinal detachment in one quadrant or a vitreous hemorrhage in, one, uh, in a patient and it may be an old branch vein occlusion which was missed and then the sequelae occurred. So here you can see there is an infrotemporal branch vein occlusion on this side and a CR central retinal vein occlusion on the other side. You know that the central retinal uh, vein occlusion is called a splash, splash tomato ketchup appearance because of the large number of hemorrhages. Now, the most important thing when you see a vein occlusion is to do the risk identification. The most important thing I look at when the patient comes to me with a vein occlusion, the first thing that you should look at is what is the age of the patient, what are the metabolic diseases that the patient has, and atherosclerosis, hypertension are the major risk factors. When you're looking at other causes, hypercoagulable states, occlusive periphrebitis, local factors, you should look for glaucoma, any evidence of inflammation. Now, how do you uh, risk? Uh, how do you proceed? So, if your patient is older than 50 years, then you have to look for systemic risk factors like hypertension and diabetes. They may be already having, in which case you already have your culprit there. If they do not have that, if they don't have hypertension and diabetes, send to a physician for a workup for hypertension or diabetes or dyslipidemias, which are the common causes. Now, if the patient is less than 50 years, you have to treat it like you would treat a young stroke. So all the causes for vein occlusions in a patient who is younger than 50 years is the same list that you have for young stroke. So you have to look at what are the risk factors you will look for. You need to look for hematological risk factors which are the coagulopathies and you need to look for the inflammatory risk factors which are the what we call broadly the collagen vascular diseases. So Hematological diseases, you have to look for your protein C, protein S, um, antithrombin 3, Leydig, Fat5, Leydig. The whole gambit has been done, including peripheral smear for workup for coagulopathies. For inflammatory, the ANA, ANCA, serum ACE, HLA profile, all of that depending on the systemic features that the patient has with the help of a rheumatologist. The occlusive vasculitis causing a venous occlusion, fundus examination will give you a clue which we will look into later. So just remember one thing. First thing, venous occlusions are almost always thrombotic. They are not embolic. So we are looking for causes of thrombus. And causes for thrombus in an older age group is usually hypertension, diabetes. In a younger age group, we have to look at both coagulopathies and inflammatory causes. So that is the main thing that you have to keep in mind. Now, um, your clinical examination should include your uh, sit lamp examination to look for neovascularization. If it's an old venous occlusion, you should look at the fundus for the what are the quadrants that are involved, what is the macular edema, and any signs of uh, the sequelae. And you're also looking for clinical signs of the etiology, whether you're looking at vasculitis or not. When it is a central retinal vein occlusion, it's very important to differentiate ischemic from non-ischemic. Now, what is the importance of differentiating? The most important is about prognostication. So ischemic CRVOs will have much less visual acuity and much bad prognosis compared to your non-ischemic CRVOs. What are the clues? First thing is visual acuity. Very poor visual acuity, like you're looking at less than six by 60, more likely to be ischemic. Second thing is RAPD. Presence of RAPD, it is an ischemic central retinal vein occlusion. Uh, third thing they say is fields, but when the visual acuity is so low, we usually do not do the fields, but if you are in doubt, if you have a visual acuity of 636, 618, you can do a visual field. Visual field mostly affected in ischemic, will not be affected in non-ischemic. The clinching diagnostic feature is your fluorescent angiogram, which will give you more than 
than 10 disc diameters of non-perfusion areas, then you're looking at ischemic. Less than 10 dd, then it is non-ischemic. And of course, the ERG with the B by A ratio not being affected is also non-ischemic. But ERG, of course, is only for research. We don't really do it. In, like I said, close to the etiology, you can look for evidence of vasculitis. So you're looking for disc edema, you're looking for vasculitis in other quadrants, then you are thinking of the one of the inflammatory pathologies and not just, uh, and then you also have to ask a proper history about any systemic causes. Now, what are we going to do? For central retinal vein occlusion, once you have differentiated between ischemic and non-ischemic clinically, you have to do an OCT to look at the macular edema. The fluorescent angiogram, if you are doubtful, if it is ischemic or non-ischemic, fluorescent angiogram advised by the CVOS study is to do it after some time once the hemorrhages are resolved, but you should remember that the CVOS study was done in the pre anti era. So now we don't really wait for three months for the hemorrhages to resolve and then do a fluorescent, you can still do the fluorescent and you can differentiate the blocked fluorescence from the CNP areas. The, the rationale was that because of the blocked fluorescence, you cannot pick up the CNP areas. But because of our new, newer imaging techniques, we can actually see the CNP areas even if there is some amount of blocked fluorescence due to the hemorrhages. So you do that and then your risk stratification becomes much easier. Prognostication becomes easier once you do the fluorescent angiogram. For macular edema in venous occlusion, we inject. First choice is usually anti vegf and and if the patient has some risk factor for anti vegf you can consider implantable steroid like dexamethasone, ozodex. If the patient is pseudo fake, cannot come for follow-up, again, you can think of an implantable steroid. In ischemic CR view, even if there is macular edema, it may become flat after injection, but vision may not improve, and that should be very clearly explained to the patient. In ischemic CR, if non-ischemic CR view, you are just going to inject till the macular edema resolves, keep the patient on follow-up for something called ischemic conversion. Non-ischemic can convert to ischemic as the disease progresses. So you have to keep the patient on follow-up monthly for the first six months, two monthly for the first year, and then uh, three monthly for the next year. If the patient has ischemic CRVO, once you have treated the macular edema, we do prophylactic panretinal photocoagulation because our patients will not come for follow-up. The recommended schedule is monthly follow-up, looking for neovascularization of the angle and the iris. Once you have more than 180 degree NVA or NVI, then you do PRP. That was the CVOS recommendation, but we generally don't follow that. If you have ischemic CRVO, you do a prophylactic PRP. So you prevent the neovascularization. Of course, vision may not improve which has to be very clearly explained. So that was CRVO. BRVO you inject for the macular edema. Modified grid laser was recommended by the BVOS but we don't follow it anymore because the anti vegfs give a better uh, treatment response. Now yeah I knew I won't have time. Okay. Arterial occlusions. Arterial occlusions as compared to the venous occlusions are 99% embolic. Okay. Except when you have vasculitic, when you have arteritis, polyarteritis, nodosa or giant cell arteritis that is causing the arterial occlusion. Otherwise, most of the time they are embolic. So your primary responsibility as an ophthalmologist is to find the source of the embolus. Treatment, we don't have much to offer them, especially if they come after. What is the retinal uh, downtime? Retinal ischemic time, 90 minutes, 90 minutes. So you have to treat, if you want to get good response in central retinal artery occlusion, you have to treat within 90 minutes, which none of our patients will reach on time. So most of the time we have nothing to offer in the way of treatment, but you can save the life of the patient if you investigate for the source of the embolus. The two important investigations that you have to do, echocardiography to look for any calcification, any vegetations in the valves, and any other thrombus, mural thrombus, etc., and a full cardiology evaluation, and carotid Doppler to look for the thrombus in the um, carotid arteries, which is the next common cause. So those two investigations you have to do. What can you offer in terms of, next slide please, time up is it? Yeah, what can you offer in terms of treatment? You can do your quickly do uh, ocular massage, which is just increasing the intraocular pressure, reducing so that the clot gets dislodged. Or you can do a paracentesis in your OPD or in the OT to suddenly reduce the intraocular pressure and allow the blood to gush through and remove the embolus from the um, uh, central retinal artery. Now, those are the two things that you can quickly do. A lot of other things have been tried, but none have been very effective. Then, um, let's say, 
Ciliorectal artery is not so important. How will you differentiate ophthalmic artery occlusion from uh, central retinal artery occlusion? I will stop with that. Ophthalmic artery occlusion from a central retinal artery. One vision will be no PL. No PL vision in a central retinal artery occlusion. What you think is central retinal artery, always remember it's probably ophthalmic artery. Second thing is the cherry red spot will not be very evident. There will be diffuse whitening of the retina, but the cherry red spot will not be seen because choroid is also ischemic. Okay, those two things can help you differentiate. We will stop with that. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you.